So yeah, and I'm not going to drill it all down, but basically um, today I'm working from, um, and you can see down in the corner still, I have a little outline here of things I want to make sure I talk about. This is my, it's not a script. It's not word for word. It's a little outline of today's webinar. Well, that's a great metaphor for what a lead sheet is for an improvising musician. It's not that it is abbreviated notation because um, there's, they're not capable of writing all the notes down or reading them all. Rather, they're the, it's just a general outline which allows room for flexibility and spur the moment changes and new little ideas and things like that. So um, the, the little definition here, I'm sure you can read, but a simplified form of music notation that outlines the essentials of a song. Um, and with the expectation that players will fill in and with, with, with what I like to call stock accompaniment styles, just like a drummer might say, let's play a swing beat or let's play a basic rock beat, or let's do a funk beat. These are the kinds of sounds, you know, that are on instruments. Let's just, you know, there's a bossa nova right here on my electric piano here. Maybe you can hear that. Here's rock. So these are stock, kind of not very creative, but just some stock forms that quickly give you the style, and then a real drummer would customize them. It's the same way with a piano player. You want to know those stock accompaniment styles so you can plug them in and get the sound that is close to the idea you have. Um, and then you can, you know, change the melody around. And a lot of times musicians will take solos, which means leave the melody and make your own ad lib melody. So essentially it's a melody in treble clef with chord symbols above it. And perhaps a style indication there are some other things which may be there. They might have lyrics. They might have little rhythmic suggestions or sample parts or hits, they're called little accents. But essentially that all each are gonna have a melody in the treble clef and chord symbols as opposed to a lead, uh, chord chart, which might just have lyrics and chord symbols, or just chord symbols, but no notation. So let's take a look. I'll go move along here and show you how it, what's next here. Let's see. Next. Here is just an example of a lead sheet taken out right out of a fake book. I chose it because this one is public domain now. Um, my Melancholy Baby, that's a professional lead sheet's what it looks like. And I'm a good musician should be able to play on that for five minutes or so with spinning out some variations based on the chords and the melody. All right. So why would you want to teach from lead sheets? Why, why, you know, why even do this? Well, I think you already know that creative teaching off page matters and you've probably heard about how it's historically been a part of our tradition, but it's dropped away in the last several decades. And so I'm not going to um, preach to the choir, but uh, I'm just going to assume you're already on board and just tell you some of the benefits here. The main one is this is how commu communicating, this is how contemporary musicians communicate. If you're in a worship band or, or playing with some g buddies in your, in your, you know, garage or you're, or you're working in any kind of setting where the music is not present, sheet music, regular sheet music, then it's just expected that you know what the chords are, you know what the chord symbols mean, and you have some sense of the styles that you might plug into those. Um, so it's sort of like, uh, figured bass was in the Baroque era. But for us now, chord symbols and melodies and on lead sheets are, um, are the, are the bread and butter. Uh, in fact, so I have here, I know I'm just real little in the middle, but I'm, I'm teaching this course right now on a Beatles on jazz piano. And here's our fake book. It's all the Beatles tunes that they ever wrote, each with just in lead sheet form. And we're working off that to develop those arrangements. And when you have them gathered together, a set of lead sheets is called a fake book. So another reason is it's just theory on the fly. It's great to just look at those chords figure out why they work the way they do. Where's the one chord? Where's the five chord? How, how, what is the analysis of this? Why does this chord sound good? You know, how is this melody built? What notes are used are in it? Are they all in the key or are they, are they have some accidentals? Does the melody essentially be based on the pentatonic scale? It's all right there and easy to look at without all the extra things that are in a fully notated piece. We learn about phrase length since most pop and jazz songs are eight measures or four measure phrases. And we see the whole roadmap on one page. We know the whole thing about where do we DS and come back and go to the coda. It's all right there in front of us, how the, 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 the roadmap, meaning how the song flows from beginning to end with introduction and ending with an outro, perhaps. Um, also, once you get it together, it's just really easy to play a lead sheet um, compared to the, the sort of fear that many people experience with the perfection expected from fully notated music. So that makes it a nice balance if you're working with a student on it, something that's fully notated and, and um, difficult and trying to get it as perfect as possible. Lead sheets, it's a little less. Um, yeah, there's there's really, you could almost say there's not really a wrong way to play a lead sheet. Maybe there's just some better ways to play it. And so with that kind of 
ease, it can be a sort of a stress reducer, perhaps to balance with um, when you're working on something that's more um, detailed. And um, the last is just a great way to put real creativity into your lessons. Um, practical creativity. I mean, creativity that actually has an end point where you can go out and play it on a gig or, or jam with other musicians or do something with it. I'm all for those creative exercises that are, are let's play three black keys while I play a, a groove under it. Let's put that on piano. And then the, maybe the students on the black keys. That's a great way to open the door to um, experiencing creativity on your instrument. Um, but it is limited in that the, the, the student may not, it, with only that much of a peek into the world of improvisation, know what they're doing. They don't know perhaps what key they're in or what chords are working or why that worked. And so lead sheets kind of fill in those gaps about what's really going on in the music. All right, let's take a look at the at the product here. What lead sheet challenge is, is, is uh, a set of lead sheets and a ready-made festival rolled into one. And I call it a festival, not a competition, because it's very important with creativity to make the uh, students feel uh, fearless about trying new things and, and diving in. So the word competition gets everybody a little uptight. Um, so there's a little list of what's there. It's basically 20 lead sheets, but actually 10 um, in in two different um 10 each in two different uh, sections, I guess. So the way it works is the student learns 10 prepared lead sheets, which they can work on as long as they like, maybe six months. And then there are 10 similar at-site lead sheets that when the lead sheet challenge day comes, when we have a day where we sit down and have that festival, they will play their prepared sheet, but they will also play a uh, at-site reading on-site to see a real-life situation of what happens if somebody walks up and says, Hey, do you guys know how to play my, my melancholy baby? And a bass player opens up a book and says, here it is. Let's try it. And you can run with it. That's what it's building towards that kind of on the spot skill. In addition, all those lead sheets are, um, are, are written for teachers in fully realized version with everything notated. Just in case you're not clear about what you would do on a lead sheet. It's, I've provided written ones. They're cheat sheets essentially for you. You won't want to show them to the students. Um, and it's just for you to kind of check what they're doing against what what uh, you would expect. And if you're not sure, you can look at that. That said, you can't take them completely verbatim. When you look at a, at a realization or a teacher's sheet and maybe the student's in a different inversion, but still doing essentially the same accompaniment, of course, that's OK. Um, it also includes some other bit, bits about how to use it, the chord glossary and so on, which I'll show you actually as we as we move along. All right. So here's how you're going to use this, and then we're going to dive in and look at it. There's three steps, really. You're going to guide your students through beginning to late intermediate lead sheets. I just want you to know it's leveled. The Larry deliberately leveled and, and over to play, take place over several years. Um, and those include sample stock accompaniments and improvisation tips. So you're going to, that's going to be the bulk of what you do. You're going to work on that and um, pick the one that is appropriate for your student at their current level. And then Secretly, you're going to compare their interpretations to your teacher realizations if you're not sure exactly what the style is, and, uh, like I said earlier. And then lastly, at some point, you will host a friendly lead sheet challenge. Perhaps it's in your studio. Maybe it's a local association's uh, festival, that, or maybe you get together with a few other teachers. Maybe it's a summer camp or something special you do at the end of the year to, to culminate with the lead sheet study. Um, and, and, and then there's, you know, you can design the prizes and, and all the fun around that. So basically you have three steps with the bulk of the time spent on the first step. So here we see an example of the lead sheet. This one's called Stuck in My Ear. Now, all of the preparatory lead sheets, so that's how it says up here, student prepared, um, on the left-hand corner. Um, if, if you can't see my mouse, somebody just let me know, or other, and I'll circle things, but I believe the mouse will show. Um, that prepared means that the student's going to work on this as long as they like, and you're going to help them. And they're 100% of the prepared pieces are originals. They are originals because the 100% of the at site sight reading lead sheets are well known tunes. And I want to make sure they've never heard the tune before when they're working on a lead sheet that's prepared so that they're, they're actually not able to call in their ear at this point. Then it's a nice surprise when they get to the at site lead sheet. 
I also wrote them very much in mind with the at site companion that they would be complementary to each other. So that, so I didn't so much just write music that Bradley likes as much as write music that was very similar to the one they're going to sight read. But, um, and I also made them just a little bit goofy with some fun lyrics and so, so on. And the reason for the lyrics is that I think it's a singing is not enough a part of our piano teaching. All creative musicians sing or grunt. Um, it doesn't mean they sing in public or they're, or they're maybe um, proud of their voice and want to make a big deal, but it just means they're looking, you know, if I'm playing a... a what was that? Something like that, you know, so I lose my voice to kind of find that creativity. That's a big part of, of something I emphasize in my own teaching. So the lyrics are provided there um, so that they can uh, support that engagement with the with the the ear, the inner ear, and the, um, and and being able to sing the tune away from the piano. So you see down here, then we have um, two suggestions for possible uh, accompaniments. And this is just level two. So we skipped the, the preparatory level and level one. We're kind of a little bit into, you know, late beginner. And here we just see a nice, nice broken chord or a block chord with a little rhythm. So in this case, we have quarter, quarter, half. And here we have half, quarter, quarter, you want to mix those up that's just fine so if the student would rather play you know long short short instead of short short long that's fine we're just showing a sample of a possible uh, accompaniment same thing here if we want to go long short short we could use, easily do um short short long so we're just going to try to take the take the the a mix of quarter and half notes that becomes somewhat of a pattern and even that pattern might vary a little bit while they play there's a question with some teachers use five sevens or dominant seven chords when they teach some of the method books, bring that out early. We're used to that. That G seven sound with an F in it. Um, my own philosophy is I don't introduce sevens for quite a while. So um, I would just use triads. Um, and therefore, um, just to accommodate both philosophies, I have um, that D is acceptable and so is D seven. So you can just use either one. What the, it's whatever's closer to what you're used to teaching or what you're finding in your method books. So let me just play this song down now. I'll go ahead and sing it and play it, and I'll put in, um, maybe I'll choose this first accompaniment, the, the broken chord. Um, mm, sometimes wish you, uh, sometimes when you sing a song, you can sing it all day long. It gets stuck inside your ear, sometimes for an entire year. Now deliberately, the ending sometimes force you to break the pattern, and that's addressed in this explanation here. It says um, phrase endings and last measure can be exceptions to pattern. So too many chords here to play a broken chord, and solving that is part of the fun. My, my you know, I've got two in a measure here and three in the measure here. How will I accommodate that with this style? That's why this is an open process. If it's generally in the style of it, um, then, then we're good to go. So that's that's the main deal of the prepared part, just putting together an accompaniment and the tune. You as a teacher would perhaps support that with roots down below. Here's a G, D, 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 you know, so we hear the little rhythm or just the whole notes, whatever you could do. And you can also put it with a backing track. Um, here, I'll just pull up right here on my piano. I happen to have a rock beat, so I'm going to... You know, we could try it with that. Uh, I'll do the other one with the block chords this time. One, two, three, and sometimes when you sing a song, teach your part. Okay, so you you know you can provide support like that. Um, and I'll just mention uh, backing tracks are readily available. A lot of pianos have them built in or drum beats. Um, Garage Band has many drum beats you can pull from. There are MIDI drum beats available. And I have a, an app I enjoy called iReal Pro, I-R-E-A-L-P-R-O, which is a, um, a way to play backing tracks with the whole band. But there's a little trick in there that you can take the mixer and turn off everybody but the drums and have a quick drum beat. So I don't want to spend too much time on that now, but I'll just mention that that's a terrific app. So now let's look at the extra challenge here. Um, this is just, just a little touch that says, why don't we use some repeated note embellishments to take this a little further? So whenever you feel like it, 
the student would repeat some of the notes, a typical embellishment. Um, and so I give some examples here. Could be played or, or, you know, just a little way to mix it up. Whenever you feel like it, and maybe it's not even the same every time. So maybe we'll put this together with some repeated notes. Sometimes. So um, just a little, a little digestible, doable, uh, achievable, quick win of an improvisation tip that works. That's the that's the key to how I do all my all my books, my That's Jazz series. You may be familiar with. I always give a small tidbit that is easy to succeed at as my improv tip. So let's take a look, go on, and I'll move quicker through these other ones. I just want to get you accommodated to it here. Here's an example of the teacher part, the realization with the left hand notated first in a block chord option, I'm sorry, broken chord option, and then in the, um, in the uh, one possibility for the mix of quarter and half notes. Notice this is a different rhythm than down here, just saying that you can use it forward or backwards, long and short, mixing and matching. And then you have just an identical uh, reminder of how the the extra challenge goes. You can take the extra challenge or not. Uh, you can kind of work with that optionally. So let's take a look at another level here. And um, this, well, not another level. Then this is the at site day. So the student practice that. They get to the competition, and lo and behold, here is skip to my loo, right? Uh, and and it is uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, skip to my loo, level two. Um, and so look how similar it is. It's almost the same thing. So or black chords. Oops. And then we might try repeated notes with that. So that's level two. This is a, a, a um, romp through the prepared sheet and then lo and behold we get there and it's very similar and we feel prepared for that in fact skip to my loo only has two chords in it the previous one i believe had had three can't remember same key lots of things that are the same let's move on to another level here um this this is the realized teacher part i told you about um here is one that's about alberti bass of course the alberti bass is going to be a big deal for everybody that's um played that, uh, any kind of classical music, and that's what the lyrics address here. So I'm gonna put that Alberti bass in the left hand, and then in the right hand, I'll go ahead and sing these fun lyrics. Uh, everyone who plays piano forte will encounter the Alberti bass. That's because of Mozart and his buddies wrote it in their scores all over the place. So just a lot of fun, just kind of make it memorable and, and silly a little bit. Um, and then I bet if I could see your chat, which I, I don't want to do right now because of the focus on the slide, that um, just think to yourself, you write in there if you like to the chat. What do you suppose the song that that is a very well-known tune uh, that I pick that is the follow-up for this? Let's take a peek. Be thinking about that. Here's your teacher realized part. Just a quick note on that. Again, you may have different inversions that would still qualify as Alberti bass. You have to take this with a grain of salt. This is not, uh, you know, hammered in stone here. It's just one possibility. Um, the f okay, so let's take a look then. What is the going further or the at sight day? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Student comes in and plays that with the same thing. You might have noticed it starts the same. Down below, in, in all cases here, I give an example of using neighbor notes in various speeds um, to create embellishments. Here's a neighbor note that goes up, which is, a, you know, a classical ornament as well. If it goes down, it's, it's you know, a mordant or an or, or a, um, you can name what, what you like. A turn is a, both neighbor notes, um, and a trill is lots of neighbor notes. So... So then they can have that extra challenge of exploring a little improvisation. Notice it's not in a jazz style. Improvisation is is um, in many styles. Let's take a, another look at another one here. And this is, uh, well, there it is written out for you for the teacher. This is the wash rag. My name is Bradley So Wash. Um, so I almost put an apostrophe wash rag, as in like So Wash's rag, but just for fun. But 
So this is a little uh, little goofy piece here. Um, and notice that the accompaniment style here is in a um, boom chick with a mo or a also called jump bass um, or, or simple stride. Uh, a couple of different names. Various authors call it different things. But it's the a single note and the chord. And, um, and sometimes the roots on the bottom, sometimes it's this closest note. So that kind of thing. Um, okay, so let's have a listen and uh, let, I'll try to sing it to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is it when I wash, there's not a towel? I was, it was just here yesterday. Here I am dripping wet for some supplies. Why would they take it away? Scrubbed my face, washed my hair, conditioned to reach for a towel. What a drag. It's no fair, nothing's here to dry my face and hair. Oops, face and hair, but for a soggy wash rag. Uh, okay, so just silly. Um, now, the left hand. In this case, is the going further, the extra challenge. And we could use whole octaves if we become used to that song. All right, and and so um, we have a way to, to develop this over several weeks as uh, that comes together. And let me just throw in: feel free to mix and match. You want to throw some neighbor notes in there from the previous tune? Go for it. You're wonder wonderful to mix up these creative concepts in this more loose extra challenge part. All right, we're getting there. This is the going further for that. The entertainer. Notice how similar the chords are. My idea is that the student sits down outside and says, "Oh, I actually know this song. This helps me that I can use my ear." Maybe they use the all the bigger chords in the extra challenge. So you you're able to plug in what you know. So I'm going to do one more tune here, just to give Leela a heads up that this is the last one I'm going to showcase here, and then I'll talk just a little bit more about it, um, and then hand it off. So this is um, this is the Rotten Day Blues, and I just want to say for a minute that blues is the roots of American music. To quote um, Willie, I think his name's Willie Dick, said, um, uh, "Blues is the roots; the rest is fruits." So blues is all through pop music. You hear it in um, just as its own art form, you know, say like Sweet Home Chicago, right? Which was a big song for the um, the Blues Brothers movie. That's it's a blues that is a blues. But you also hear it referenced even in classical music, such as Gershwin's... Um, let's see... bluesy notes in there and you hear it in rock and roll as uh, kind of tossed in um, uh, you know, on top of the other tunes so so it's it's just if you're going to play um, American influenced popular styles from spirituals to to pop music to rock to blues to gospel then you're going to have some blues involved in it and that's why it's so important that we understand this uh, this form and when I teach blues, as I do every summer in my summer courses, I tend to start at a somewhat high level. The beautiful thing about what Leela is going to show you is she's going to really show you how to get it going with a younger beginner student who is just getting their feet wet. My students tend to be um, classical musicians, classically trained who are learning to improvise. So their, their skills are higher and we tend to get a little bit more quickly into the more complex things. So <coughs> you'll see that soon. So this is the Rotten Day Blues, and I'll just um, plug in the suggested style here. There's uh, three suggested styles, uh, and you could play it like this, or, or here's another one, or this one, or there's other blues. So these are basically boogie styles um, that you can lift from other tunes or, or, or use these. Um, so I'm just going to run this down with a simple left hand. I think I'll use this one. Or maybe I'll just do quarter notes since I'm singing at the same time. One, two, ready, I go late for school. Lost my shoes. That's not all. The rest is really bad news. 
Went to class, shared my views. Teacher said I, I had I ought to read all the news. Nothing's right. What's more to lose? I guess I've got the rotten day blues. Yeah, now what's for lunch? Bowl of ooze. I forgot to pay, so add to my dues. Found a phone. Don't know who's. Now I'll be the one that they all accuse. I snooze that practice. Missed my cues. I guess I've got the rotten day blues. Um, okay, and then the going further for this explores some ways to take a really simple blues lick and manipulate it in um, in various directions. So here is a simple idea, which is forward. I mean, I'm just suggesting that if you know that forward, you can play it backwards or inside out. So you might go back then and play the tune. And mix up some of those so some of those licks. Also just want to be clear that I'm skipping levels here. If you feel it's leveling too fast, I'm just jumping around. We're already up to level seven here, um, rather than show you the whole caboodle. Um, so the final one I'd like to show you is the at sight. Student has learned that blues has a little sense of where the chords change and what that art form is all about. And they roll in for the at sight and what do they encounter, but the, perhaps the most famous blues of all, the St. Louis blues. And that um, sounds like this. I hate to see that evening sun go down. A little place for improvisation. I hate to see that evening sun go down. My mother used to sing this a lot. Oh, uh, that's when the time, or something like that, I forget the words. When my woman done lost his town, etc. So we go into an authentic blues, which perhaps is recognizable. Um, okay, so let's, um, the question does arise, I just want to really quickly in passing, how do we prepare for this? I'll just quickly show this up, it's not about today, but this series published by KJO's Chos Music is my creative chord series. This is a great way to prepare for the, something like this. this. This is all about learning to play lead sheets from the very first lesson. Um, so just throw that as a resource. So that's just a couple more points here. What else it comes with is a um, chord glossary. Just in case you're not sure what a chord is as you go along, I have it broken down for you here, um, all on based on the root of C. And you can um, you know, look up a chord or, or, or transpose from there. Just just to make sure there's no questions. If you're not really sure what a chord symbol is. I know sometimes classical chord symbols can be a little different than pop jazz. So that clears that up. And here is a judge's rubric. It just is a suggestion uh, on the day of the festival of of the various parts of it that uh, like a steady beat, melody, accompaniment, chords, or baseline roots, the extra challenge, and just for showing up. And it has suggested possible points for that. So you get one point just for coming to the festival and going ahead and um, overcoming any concerns you had. And and um, and then you score these as you go down, and, and then you can do what you like with that. Piece of candy, uh, you know, uh, vacation for everybody on a cruise ship around the world. Um, so I know your piano teacher budget can handle that. Um, anyway, so they, the prizes are given out or everybody gets a whatever. You handle that however you like. This is just a guide for you. You don't even need to show the students um, or the judge. This is your evaluation form. Student's name, what level they're working on, 40 points possible, how, divided between prepared and at site pieces, and a few comments for the student to read later. Sort of like Federation or Guild or, or other festivals. Um, now, how... For you, how this breaks down is um, because you're going to do this in a whole studio, I, I go ahead and provide a license for you to print or copy without any questions asked up to 10 copies uh, of this um, lead sheet challenge. So you can use it with like up to 10 students. The reason uh, for that is if an entire festival of a whole district wants to do this, you can see that, you know, if 50 teachers in a in the, um, you know, let's say Nevada Music Teachers Association wants to do this, uh, it, you know, it's fair for me, that they that, I, that the whole thing doesn't just sell to um, to huge numbers. So I, I feel it's fair that that ten copies 
is a reasonable amount for um, each teacher to participate and send them home with the students and, and things like that. So for a big festival, just buy more. Um, it's an honor system. You could get away with taking just 10, but I'm, I'm just, teachers tend to be awfully honest people. Purchase the Lead Sheet Challenge in the BradleySoWash.com store under Theory and Style Books. And until next time, enjoy your creative music making journey.